Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Book Festival's bookend event, hosted by the National Book Critics Circle. My name is David Varno, and I serve on the board of the NBCC. The NBCC honors outstanding writing through our annual awards and fosters a national conversation about literature by supporting the work of book critics. All of the writers joining us tonight were recognized by the NBCC's John Leonard Prize for best first book in any genre. Named after a founder of the NBCC and a former editor of the New York Times Book Review. Now in its 10th year, the prize has honored writers such as Anthony Mara, Tommy Orange, Carmen Maria Machado, and Raven Lalani, and is selected by a large group of the organization's 700 voting members. This fall, a committee will begin the months long process of selecting the best first book of 2022. If you are a member and would like to be on the committee, please stay tuned for a call for volunteers. If you are interested in joining the NBCC and would like to help judge the award, please visit our website or write to us at membership at bookcritics.org. It's a busy season for the NBCC. A new committee is hard at work reading for the newly created prize for a work in translation, named after late NBCC board member, Greg Barrios. Our new class of emerging critics begins meeting with mentors and embarking on our annual program in literary criticism. And the board's award committees are working toward our finalists announcement in January. We also encourage our members to nominate candidates for the Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award and the Toni Morrison Achievement Award for an institution and to submit their own book criticism for the annual Balakian Prize, which carries a cash prize of $1,000. Tonight's authors will read for about five minutes each from new work, and then we will have a conversation. If there's time before we end at 8 p.m. Eastern, we will take questions from the audience. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please add it to the chat. Tori Peters is the author of the novel Detransition Baby, published by One World, which won the 2021 Penn Hemingway Award for debut fiction. It was also a finalist for the NBCC's John Leonard Prize, a finalist for the Brooklyn Public Library Award, and was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. A collection of four novellas titled Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones will be published by Random House in 2023. She has an MFA from the University of Iowa and a master's in comparative literature from Dartmouth. Tori rides a pink motorcycle and splits her time between Brooklyn and an off-grid cabin in Vermont. Larissa Pham is an artist and writer in Brooklyn. Born in Portland, Oregon, she studied painting and art history at Yale University. She has written essays and criticism for the Paris Review Daily, The Nation, Art in America, Guernica, and elsewhere. She was an inaugural Yee Day Up Fellowship recipient from the Jack Jones Literary Awards Retreat her debut essay collection is called Pop Song. She is also the author of Fantasian, a novella. Kirsten Valdez Quaid is the author of The Five Wounds, which won the Center for Fiction's first novel prize and the Rosenthal Family Foundation Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award and the Lambda Literary Award. Her story collection, Night at the Fiestas, won the John Leonard Prize from the National Book Critics Circle. The Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and a Five Under 35 Award from the National Book Foundation. She teaches at Princeton. I'm so glad the three of you can be here tonight, and I'm excited to see what you have to read for us. Um, Tori, we'll start with you. Great. Um, so just as a little bit of an introduction, um, we thought that we'd read uh, new work tonight. So this is um, this is a new thing that I'm writing. Uh, I'm not totally sure what it's going to be, but uh, here it goes. Um, I didn't know that those Brazilian girls had a madam. I thought they were sexual entrepreneurs like myself, a coalition of independent go-getters who valued autonomy over their workplace and schedule. I had been in the profession a few years when I got involved with them, and during that first period. 
All I ever really wanted from the work was a middle-class lifestyle like the one I'd grown up with. A KitchenAid stand mixer on the counter, plush three-ply toilet paper in the bathroom, and my own washing machine. Fuck a laundromat. I met the Brazilians through a client of mine, a rich man from Israel. Much later, when he became one of my chief co-schemers, I would learn how much I had lazily assumed about him from his nationality and wealth, how much he had found it advantageous to let those like me assume what we would from the scant selective information he offered about himself so that satisfied with the stereotype, we just we declined to scrutinize him further. My business had been simple in that era. I kept two I kept posted two ads online simultaneously, one ad as an escort and one ad as a sugar baby. The Israeli responded to my ad for a sugar baby. I assumed that he was like most of the men who answered my sugar baby ad. He wanted the escort experience without having to think of himself as a man who hired escorts. Much more pleasant to think of himself as a man of the world introducing a promising young woman to the finer aspects of life. It was all the same to me. The only difference was in the negotiations. As an escort, I offered a fixed hourly price. Working as a sugar baby required more finesse because I had to conduct and guarantee the transaction without appearing to do so. Through trial and error, I had developed a basic but effective pitch. I would tell the man on the other end of the line that I wanted tokens of trust, that I would promise never to nag him about money, but in the, that in return, I would want him to take initiative in seeing to my lifestyle. At this point, I would wait for the inevitable pause, the hiss of the line while a man calculated, wanting to agree to a relationship based on trust rather than money, for that meant he was not technically hiring a prostitute, but nervous as to what exactly he was committing to pay. Even those men most invested in their displays of confidence took a moment to search for how the trap might spring. Into this void, I would sigh and offer a suggestion, as though against my better scruples, but on his behalf. I really hate giving a number, I'd confess, but perhaps it would make you more comfortable if I offered a range for guidance. A range? What do you mean? Let's say between X and Y dollars an evening, I'd say. Maybe for a little tryst, you could give me only the lower end of the range, but if I spend all night or travel with you, then consider the upper end. It's distasteful to haggle with each other. I really want a relationship based in trust and care. You trust me to never mention a number, and I'll trust you to treat me fairly. At this, his saliva glance would release. What silly bitch of a hooker has a pay what you want fee structure? The men who hired me were indulging themselves. No one wants to think of himself as stingy when indulging. Otherwise, what's the point of indulging? I learned that the pleasure a man takes in his own sense of goodness, especially when, with, when dealing with a girl so naive she doesn't even know how to properly ask for money, could be a powerful weapon against him. Get a man to prosecute his own honor and he'll always overpay. That's why I didn't mind the hassle of sugaring. In practice, hour per hour, I made the same money sugaring as I did escorting. Except over the course of an especially unfortunate five hours of escorting, I might have fucked five men. For that same five hours of sugaring, I'd have fucked only one. What's more, when I did my work right, I'd arrange for us to go to a romantic dinner first and coax him into indulging himself with, say, a gigantic steak and a bottle or two of full-bodied wine. By the time we returned to his hotel, he'd loll around clutching his stomach and fuck for 15 minutes at most. None of that hours long acrobatic sex for me. Before I met the Israeli, my key to maximizing a time to money sex work ratio had been mediocre sex with mediocre men. Thanks. That's that's great. Um, the rest uh, of, I guess um, I should say more. <laughs> Sorry, I thought the yeah, yeah, was I mean, going. Do you, do you want to? Um, before we go, Larissa, do you want to tell us anything more about? Oh, piece? sure. Um, yeah, it, this is the beginning of a novel um, or what is maybe a novella, I'm not quite sure. And it's um, it's actually about, um, I was really interested in the finances of this and I wanted to, I was thinking a lot about how um, identity, um, especially trans identity or sex work identity and all these things can end up becoming commodified or, or instrumentalized and can hide it, hide or be deployed around all sorts of ideas around ethics. So um, yeah, that's kind of the project and I'm not exactly sure how it's gonna pan out. Thank you though. 
cool. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. Uh, it's always so exciting to hear new work. Um, I am reading a sort of pretty meta section from a, a tentative novel that I'm working on. I did a genre switch, but I, which I would love to talk to you all about later in this panel. Um, but the premise is, what you need to know basically is that the narrator is a woman um, on, on book tour uh, for a novel, her debut. Um, and the novel is like kind of, you know, it, it's, it's autobiographical. Um, and she's, she's in a car right now talking to someone who's giving her a ride to Iowa City. In the car, conversation with Jess dwindled. The radio fuzzed out and she reached for the knob to find a new station landing on a top 40s channel. After a few minutes, that signal faded too, and we sat in silence. In the distance, I saw a long row of white windmills turning. As we drove, it seemed that there was a whole grid of them installed across the prairie, more appearing with each mile. At night, Jess said, there's a red light on the windmills that flashes. I think it's to prevent planes from crashing into them. What's strange, she continued, is that the lights blink in unison. I don't know how they're synchronized, she said. All across the plains, they flash at the same time like the beating of a giant heart. Every single one, I asked. Yeah, Jess said, you'll see it later if you're driving around. It's hard to miss. The windmills turned and turned and from the car, their movement seemed slow, ungainly, the only elegance of it, the long white arms narrowing into rounded points. Even if the lights synchronized at night, it seemed impossible that their turning and twirling ever would. Watching them, I was reminded of a moment in an Annie Dillard book where she encounters a snake and appreciating the taper of its body, wishes hers ended in such a fine point. But everything ends in empty space, I thought. Fingertips, windmills, everything was bounded by some kind of finitude, at least in physical space. Now Jess was asking about my book tour. Was I excited? How was travel going? Was I looking forward to the reading? It's been good so far, I said, though it's just started. Honestly, I said, and I hadn't meant to tell her this, but the words began coming. Honestly, it almost doesn't matter whether I'm selling any books or not. It just feels so good to be away from the city. Then, and again, I hadn't meant to tell her any of this. I told her about my breakup, which had happened less than a month before my novel was to come out. The timing of it was unrelated, I was pretty sure, but I discovering that publishing a book made you insane, and I was very difficult to live with in the months leading up to publication. I set up a search engine alert for my name and scoured the internet for even the smallest murmurings of press, positive or negative. I deactivated and reactivated my social media accounts multiple times per week. I felt this didn't seem like an exaggeration, like I was being watched at all times by some vague assembly determined to catch me airing. And I constantly feared someone discovering something terrible about me, which I had already helpfully provided the key to by writing a whole book, albeit a novel, about it. My neuroticism had served to illuminate the underlying difficulties of our relationship. This was my narrative of it, at least, which was the one that made it bearable. And one day in late March, the relationship collapsed. We had been together for nearly five years, living together, sharing minor finances, and perhaps we would have continued in the same way for five more. The issue, I told Jess, was that he had started to want things, children, a retirement plan, home ownership, that I couldn't conceive of wanting. But at the same time, the only thing that I wanted from him, which was commitment, stability, and love, seemed ever more inconsistent. How did he think that he could have a family with me with this vast emotional distance between us? We stopped having things to say to each other, and he confessed to me that he had been thinking of other people. Not even specific women, he said, just the possibility of being seen by someone who wasn't me. Somehow that felt like the saddest thing of all that he just didn't want it to be me. When the relationship ended, it came as a relief. I couldn't bear to be in the city, so I left. Was it hard to leave? Jess asked. No, I said, in the end, it wasn't hard at all. Great, thanks, Larissa. Uh, Kirsten. Um, I love that description of pre-publication anxiety. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to read from a short story, just the beginning of a short story um, that came out um, at the 
beginning of the summer called I Know What's Best for You, Stories on Reproductive Freedom, edited by Shelley Oria. Um, and I wrote this um, and it's set in a near future, well, as I wrote it, it was set in a near future Arizona where um, abortion had been outlawed. And I didn't quite realize just how near future it was. Um, so um, this is called Christians in the Catacombs. Sometimes, even five years later, after all that happened, Lauren dreams that she is back in Calvary Youth Group playing Bible games. Regardless of how uneventful these dreams are, and they're almost always uneventful with an intense dream focus on logistics and turn-taking, Lauren wakes in the dark with her heart pounding. Tonight in the dream, they're play playing biblical charades, and Lauren is watching Shannon Williams enact something incomprehensible, waving her arms like an octopus. Lauren is trying to concentrate when her eyes fly open. Terror courses through her and she listens in the dark, wondering if whatever woke her was inside or outside the dream. The apartment is quiet. In the vents, the air conditioner labors. Lauren switches on the bedside lamp, listens hard for a noise from the hall, switches off the lamp. Still, she has a sense of a malicious presence breathing in the room. She wraps the blanket tightly around her despite the fact that it is too hot. Her heart thrashes, the blood loud in her ear. In life, the games were an embarrassing affair. There was the self-conscious reluctance to participate, countered by the reluctance to let down sad, goofy, enthusiastic Pastor Kevin. And then there was always the moment at the end when Pastor Kevin gave his earnest, long-winded explanation of the lesson behind whatever stupid game they'd been forced to play. Christians in the catacombs, for example, was just sardines, but it was a lesson in Christian persecution, which was a big thing even today. They had to learn how in the olden times, the Christians all crammed into the grave niches in the catacombs to hide from the Romans and what, slept there? Like businessmen in those Japanese capsule hotels? Lauren thought it was gross pretending to sleep among dead people, but she did enjoy folding herself in th into the utility closet beside Chris Maycomb. They barely had a chance to whisper hello before geeky Sam Pinto found them and squeezed in too, plucking at his braces in the dark. Lauren could smell Chris Makeham's powerful deodorant, and she felt his leg against her own. Bible verse pictograms, balloons of faith, sometimes just plain old tag. The game Lauren liked best was Guess the Baby, which wasn't actually a game and just happened once when everyone brought in a baby picture and Pastor Kevin stuck them on the wall and you had to guess who was who. The lesson was about how a person can grow closer to Jesus over time. Lauren enjoyed these glimpses into people's past, into their home lives, like seeing whose mothers dressed them like little Edwardian lords and whose mothers photographed them drool-bellied in saggy diapers. Lauren had chosen the picture her mother kept on her bureau when she was a fat-cheeked one-year-old gazing seriously out from under the big bow stuck, on, stuck atop her bald head. You're cute, Chris Makeham said, tapping the bow. Thanks, said Lauren. She pointed to the big-headed blonde toddler in a baseball jersey. You too. Even as a baby, his dimples were as deep as the tufting on a couch. She didn't have a crush on Chris Makeham per se. All things considered, she was more into Patrick Diaz at school, who was a senior on the soccer team and whose calves she couldn't help staring at. But she thought Chris Makeham might like her and she liked that. Pastor Kevin, hovering, cast Lauren a warm smile, telegraphing his approval, and Lauren blushed. Back then at 16, Lauren was a good girl, a good enough girl. She went to church with her parents and little sisters, attended youth group each Wednesday night. At the snack table, she almost always skipped the Safeway cookies and stuck to Diet Coke and carrot sticks. If temptation was especially strong, she had her cinnamon gum. She definitely had her crap together, but that didn't mean she was uptight. She posted sexy selfies, blowing kisses at the mirror, one tank top strap slipping down a shoulder. She went to parties in the foothills and demurred when offered weed or cigarettes. She'd had a boyfriend the year before, and she'd given him hand jobs and let herself be fingered. One evening after a rousing game of In the Lion's Den, Chris Maycomb placed a plastic cup of Diet Coke on Lauren's desk, then nudged her, indicating her journaling Bible with his chin. Nice, he said. She shrugged. She was proud of her work, her tidy, cheerful handwriting, which could be its own font, her doodles and painstakingly drawn borders. Chris's own Bible was filled with blank margins, except for a few notes scrawled in ballpoint when Pastor Kevin put things on the board to copy down. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much.
Thank you. That was great. This is all lovely to hear. Thank you, everyone, for for sharing. Um, so the the first question is uh, is like hopefully like kind of an easy one and it'll sort of like transition from from your your first books and into maybe getting to talking about what you just read. Um, but I'm wondering um, how how your first book and and the success um, has changed your life as as a writer. Uh, and if it's changed your impression of what is possible in your work. Well, um, I, I, I'll go first on that. I'm, I'm very curious um, what, uh, what Kirsten has to say, but having two books because I sort of just need advice about it. Um, for me, uh, I wrote my book not knowing if I'd have an audience, not, you know, I self-published my previous books. And I have found um, the response to my book to be pretty chilling to my writing now, where I, I'm sort of constantly veering back and forth between uh, like, you know, basically be like, I can imagine all the responses to it in a way that I couldn't before. And, you know, parts of my book uh, attracted the ire of bigots or transphobes or something that there was a, a whole to do with the women's prize. And so like, I have this thing where, where sometimes I will write something and I will, I'll, I will actually now imagine the consequences that uh, will get me. And it used to be, I would write a funny joke and I'd be like, my friend will love this joke. This would be great. And now I imagine how I'm going to have to like talk to somebody in like the UK and explain that joke. And the whole thing just becomes like so tiring and boring to imagine that I will cut the joke. And then, and then I'll have this thing where because I cut the joke, I'll then like veer the other direction. I'll be like, no, I refuse to be censored. And I'll write something that's like too edgy just to like prove that I still can or something, you know, to be like, check out this, like this will provoke people. And, and then I have to be like, no, that's not right either. Like I'm not actually writing to provoke people or to like, you know, prove that I can say edgy things or, or whatever. And none of that response, none of that thing that's going on is actually like internal to what I really care about. It's all kind of in the shadow of certain responses, both I think from like trans community and from, from bigots. Um, and it's only now maybe a year and a half later that I'm starting to like get some clarity, but I've started and abandoned three projects in the last year and a half, um, largely because of this kind of being unsure. So that's, it's not maybe that positive an answer, but that is my mm. actual experience. Yeah, th thanks for sharing. I mean, do, um, Larissa, do you, I mean, do you have like, do, do have voices entered your head in that way now or, or um, were, were they already there? I mean, I, I'm curious how, how Tori's response resonates with, with both you and Kirsten, but also um, I don't want to tumble over <laughs> the, the answer you were already thinking of, of giving. No, Tori, I'm so glad you said that. I mean, you know, as this passage that I read implied, like I had a really jolly time leading up to the publication of my book. Um, you know, uh, I think, and as a writer of nonfiction, um, I actually, I think like having a book come out really drove me from the internet. Um, I was seeing how people were being read and how sort of in bad faith, like most writing was being encountered, especially like online, which is, you know, where you hear the conversations, like, you know, you dream of like overhearing two really wonderful undergrads, like talking about your book at a coffee shop, but that's like not the conversation you're hearing, like you're just seeing horrible things online. Um, so actually, even while I was writing pop song, I was like, I need to log off because if I, if I don't, I will just be writing for these voices and I will be writing for like my worst critics who like don't actually care about the project that I'm engaged in. 
Um, so that definitely resonates. And then I think I coped with having an essay collection come out by um, running to the arms of an MFA program in fiction and switching genres and just being like, I love lying. I love making things up. I love not fact checking. I love not having to say that this happened to me or that, you know, um, that these things are truthful in any way, except for emotionally, which is like what I'm trying to do. Um, but I think weirdly having, and try to be curious to know how you feel about this. And also curious to know that you have a second book in the world. Like, I do think that having um, a small press, like smaller project out in the world took a little bit of the pressure off of like doing like a, a big debut. Cause I was like, well, I kind of know what it's like to be in the world, but in a much smaller way, I think the exposure that actually having a full length um, project out in the world is kind of beyond what I could have ever imagined. Um, but now that that's done, it's like, okay, well, the next thing is never going to, it's not going to be my first thing. So at least that's done and over with. Um, I never have to worry about debuting again. <laughs> that, that feels like a relief. Totally. That's so true. You, you only have one first book. Um, I, I think, you know, in some ways I was, um, my, my first book was a collection of short stories, which, you know, they, they rarely sell um, as, as, all that well um and um that was the case for mine um and so you know winning the john leonard prize was so wonderful i mean it was it was an, an assurance that people were interested in in the kinds of stories that i really really wanted to tell and needed to tell um and at that point when my collection came out I was already deep into my novel and um it that that sort of evidence of, of faith in my work was something that I could draw on as I continued to write the novel um and I think my my experience since the novel came out is much more similar to yours Tori I mean I didn't um I, mean, I don't have any internet presence. And so I didn't have to hear what anybody said about it. And I, I don't think it drew the um, kinds of, I mean, it certainly didn't draw the kind of attention that your, your novel drew. Um, but I, I mean, the reason I loved your description in your novel excerpt, Larissa, of that anxiety is that, I mean, it was, that rang so true. I mean, I was, so so anxious about exposure and you know um all kinds of worries about like exposing my family and would people you know read into it and you know how how do i protect the people i love and also you know d defend the fact that it is fiction um that that was all um really stressful for me and um and it it absolutely had a chilling effect on my writing. It um, took a long time for me to to write, <laughs> to feel to feel like I wanted anyone to read anything I wrote again. Um, and you know, and it feels really good to want to write again. Um, so that that time did pass. That's hmm. reassuring to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so so here's a question that like might kind of take us back inside. And I, I feel like almost a little funny asking it after some of the, the responses about the the bigots and the bad faith readers out there. But I guess I still feel like, you know, like you all, you know, were in, inspired to to share, you know, a bit, big parts of, of, of your lives and, and, and your ideas. Uh, in in your first books, your beliefs, your experiences, um, and, and I think that's sort of the the case with a lot of authors when they write their first books. They they put a lot of themselves uh, in into the work, details about their communities. Um, when it comes to fiction, sometimes thinly veiled descriptions of friends, lovers, family, <laughs> themselves. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk you know, thinking back on, on those first books um, about some of the choices that you made in terms of, you know, what you 
what you chose to put in, what you maybe were excited about expressing of, about yourselves and elements of, of your lives and about sharing. Uh, and if there was anything that, that you sort of consciously chose to, to reserve um, I, either for a, a future project or because it just didn't fit with the project. I'm happy to uh, take this one first, unless Tori, are you really racing? No, please. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think I think as as the nonfiction uh, book on the panel, um, it's interesting to to think about this question because uh, the line between like what is and what is not included feels like very definite. Because um, I'm positing that everything in the book, you know, did happen to some degree. Um, it's rooted in, in an event um, or in events. Um, and so thinking about it a lot, uh, I, I felt very strongly about framing this as like a project and, and being like, you know, my, my job is to make it seem seamless, but I also want you to know that there's so much that I didn't include. And a lot of interviews that I gave around the, around the publication were like, oh, well, you know, I framed it this way, or my character does this, or like, you know, like narratively, I wanted this to happen to kind of point towards the, the creative nature of this, of this piece. Like I wasn't just opening a Word document and like dumping my guts on it. You know, like there's a craft and in, in, in sort of, uh, shoring up my reliance on that craft, I wanted to create like a distinction between myself as a person and the product of this book, which is what it ultimately became. Um, that being said, I was really excited to work long. Um, I really wanted to write a book as opposed to um, publishing essays online because I was like, I can go ham in a, in a book. I can like kind of be like a little more honest and raw and like, people who are going to read that are going to get like halfway through the book and then they're they're either going to be like okay this is for me or it's not for me but it's not going to be like some rando you know like they've at least picked it up they've at least gotten there and that gave me like some faith in the reader to be like well like I, if if you're with me if you're trusting me to do this then like I can share this with you like this format allows me to share a little bit more with you and trust a little bit more and like trust that we have entered into a contract as writer and reader um, so that was really exciting to to think about that that trust a little bit more. Yeah, um, thank you. That for me, um, I feel like this this what's in this what 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 is in this book that's different than before is I think a sense of address, like, uh, um, which I'm thinking about a little bit in context with what Larissa said. When I, so much of my work, I, I came to like the publishers in a, in a very unusual path in that I was part of this like writing scene in Brooklyn that was mostly trans writers in like 2013, 2014. And, um, and all of that work was, produced under this like ethos of like sort of trans for trans writing. It was part of this, you know, this press top, I was part of this press top side press and my projects, I had this, I had this idea that I was gonna write five novellas uh, each in a different genre <clears throat> and show how trans lives actually really fit in with a lot of, a lot of the uh, existing genres. And it's not sort of like you have to create new genres for trans stuff. So I had horror, I had um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, dystopian fiction, I had teen romance and, and Detransition Baby was supposed to be a soap opera. Like I started it as like, this is a soap opera and I'm gonna publish, self publish as a soap opera. So everything about it initially was like really for, um, for this really targeted audience, which meant that there, a lot of explanations weren't in it. A lot of um, uh, the language that I chose was like, you had to know what a, a lot of these words meant. And I expected the audience to know what a lot of these words meant. Um, and slowly, like over the course of the book, I realized like, okay, soap operas are actually not novella length. Um, so probably it's a novel, but still my idea of, of who was gonna read it was, was quite different. So, so if, for instance, the book is dedicated to divorced cis women. 
that is now taken quite like literally like, oh, Tori dedicated this book to divorce <laughs> this woman. She had this affinity with them and blah, blah, blah. When I first wrote it, I thought I had no sense that divorce cis women were ever going to read it, much less take me seriously about it. It was like a tongue in cheek thing that I thought would be like funny for trans readers to read, to be like, haha, I'm reading a divorcee, you know, literature, but really <laughs> it's for me. Or like all these kind of like levels of irony that are in the book or in, was in the framing of the address of the book that came out of a really specific time and moment. And you know, for me, a lot of that is now, is gone. Like, I can't pretend that the, that the audience that I had is the same. I can't pretend that like the moments of production are the same. I can't pretend that I'm even the same. And so like, what's in this book versus what's out of it is like, it's a whole method of, of creation, a whole like context for creation that I can't get back. And I don't even know if I want to get it back, but it means that like everything I'm writing going forward, it's an, it's an entirely different method of writing. It's an entirely different way of framing myself. Um, and sometimes I'm excited to see what that produces. And sometimes I think I'm producing stuff that's just like wildly banal because I'm missing that previous context. Uh, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but that is what feels like the biggest difference for me. Yeah, yeah, that does. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's see. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear about um, the early influences um, that proved essential to writing these first books. You know, what what were they, and and did your relationship to your influences? Um, you know, Tori, you might have sort of answered this a little bit already, but did your relationship did your relationship to your influences change over the course of your writing? Well, maybe maybe Kirsten could say because I'm actually curious about that last one too for for Kirsten. Sure. Yeah. Um. So I mean, like I said, my first book was a collection of short stories, and I wrote those short stories when I was in um, was, I mean, before graduate school. Um, for one of them, but most of them were written in graduate school and in the years after. And, um, you know, so I was really, really influenced by what I was learning about how to write a story and by um, what I was reading at the time. Um, it was, um, Alice Monroe was a big influence, um, William Trevor. Um, I mean, this was, it was a long time ago, so I, <laughs> I have trouble um, even, even remembering. Um, but, but so my novel grew out of one of the short stories that was in my collection. Um, it's also called The Five Wounds. And um, when I wrote the story, The Five Wounds, I was really thinking a lot about Flannery O'Connor's, um, 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 oh God. Well, A Good Man is Hard to Find, um, but also um, Parker's Back was a story that was really, really important to me as I was writing that story. Um, and also Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory was sort of right there. Um, and then when I extended, when I decided to extend that story and um, explore what happens after to this family, um, then you know, I was reading, it was years later, and I was reading a whole different <laughs> batch of work um, and a lot of a lot of novels and um, stuff that was more realist than um, than maybe the um, Parker's back and um, some of the things I was reading early on. have a bit of a short answer um, and it's it's cool to hear about those influences also so thank you and also thank you for just acknowledging that like with time we also sort of forget um, or like you know our references also change um, I, I think a lot about like how useful the concept of like juvenilia has been to just like continuing to make work because 
I don't know if either of you feel this way, but sometimes I look at things that I've made and I'm like, well, that was very stupid and I can't believe I did that. And, um, you know, I hope that I can make something better. <laughs> and, um, but it's nice to just be like, well, you know, the work that we make in the past, like, is like significant of like one point in our lives. And then like, as we continue to like make new things, like those references change. Um, so the references that I was looking at for pop song, which are all still like touch tones for me, um, were a lot of like essays, a lot of um, memoirs, uh, particularly by like, like the certain kind of memoir that I've, I've called like the, the sort of like unhinged white woman memoir, um, which I <laughs> reference as a way to like mostly give myself permission to share and to write about my own mm -hmm. life. Um, and it's, it's nice to think about those those touchstones and then to also be like, okay, like you were very helpful for me. And now I'm also interested in these other things. I'm interested in reading like um, other categories of writing or styles of writing. And thank you for all that you have done for me. And um, it's time to try something new. I don't know if that really answered the question. I'll let you think about it, but it's just what, you, what, what I thought of. No, that yeah. I relate to that. Totally. I feel like all the books that I was reading when I read Detransition Baby, like I don't want to read anymore in a certain way. Like, um, I mean, I still love a bunch of them, but also, yeah, like the books with um, that were just sort of about like what it means to have like relationships in Brooklyn and like messy sex and like dissociating and like all the sort of stuff. I was so into it. And I have like a I get sent a lot of books like that now and I have this like like and I appreciate all the writers who are doing it but I have this like sense of like um like new disidentification with it in a way that like I'm not exactly sure where it comes from it's like I want I want to do something different I want to identify with something different right now um so for me like uh yeah like a lot a lot there are a lot of trans writers that I came up with who I still definitely identify with, but the, the books that I was reading as I read, um, as I wrote Detransition Baby were these books about like basically being angsty in your late twenties, early thirties in Brooklyn. And um, usually as a woman and I'm finding, I'm finding, yeah, a sort of disidentification with those books happening to me right now that I'm, not sure where it's coming from and it's interesting also the idea of juvenilia like there's a way in which i i've been paying attention to a lot of books that i think there's a difference almost between first books and the books that get a lot of attention like i just read this book this this biography of of uh garcia marquez and how it was like he had written many books but the book that like changed him was uh, 100 Years of Solitude, or similarly, there, similarly, there was, um, uh, the, they became sort of, these writers become different writers after their big books. Saul Bellow, I think also, and when I read a, a, a memoir of Saul Bellow that his son said that the difference between Herzog pre and after was that it was young Bellow and old Bellow and, and, and the period of like demarcation in the life was Herzog. And I, I, I don't want that to have happened. Like, I don't know if it happened to me. I've only had one book. So it seems like, and obviously <laughs> comparing myself to those two is extremely pretentious, but nonetheless, it's like, I have this like thirst in some ways to go back to juvenilia, to find that like ju that energy of juvenilia to not enter in some ways, like the middle age period of writing or that, or even the, um, you know, the old, the old bellow version of writers like I'm terrified that I'm an, I'm an old bellow all of a sudden I don't think I am but I, it's like <laughs> it's a fear um and so I'm and and so that disidentification that I talk about before is actually something that haunts me rather than like that I'm excited about because it, I'm afraid it means I'm old in the writer sense not in, in, in the well maybe I'm old in other ways too anyway I'll end there <laughs> <laughs> I love that that reminds me of something that an old friend of mine used to say about Jonas Mikas, who was kind of a drinking buddy back in the aughts and, and was just like very like youthful and, and almost childlike at times in his demeanor and personality. Um, and the proverb was, 
um, when when you're old, be young, and when you're young, be old. I think it's a Vietnamese proverb. Uh, and I just I just love that. I always think about that. Um, let's see. So I'm really curious about your relationship to book reviews, uh, and if you if you read reviews of your books, and if you if you don't, I'm curious about why not. But more so, I would love to hear. If, if you do read them, um, and this is getting away from the kind of like smaller minded, like online chatter, but you know, what, what's something in, in like old fashioned reviews of, of your work that's like really struck you as like, they got it so wrong or like, I, you know, didn't think of it that way. So I wish I could say I didn't read reviews because I feel like the coolest writers don't or <laughs> say they don't. Um, I totally read my reviews and I think about them and I smart from them and you know they they take up a lot of space in my mind. Um, I I think uh, you know most of the time I'm just really impressed by by the reviews. I think a lot of times um, reviewers will point out things that I only half noticed or didn't um, or didn't really mean to do, but I can see is working in the in the work. Um, and that's always really exciting. Um, with my especially with my novel that just came out, um, and it's called The Five Wounds, and um, it opens with a character in um, a passion procession playing the role of Jesus. And um, it one character is in a sort of Catholic lay community of um, penitents. And I don't know why I was so surprised that I was um, spoken of as a Catholic writer. And, um, and some of the reviews that really highlight that, especially in um, Catholic journals have been pretty surprising. And um, and at points I, I sort of wonder if they read the same book that I wrote <laughs> um, hmm. because it's, it's pretty, at least from my perspective, pretty critical of, of um, Catholicism and, um, that's that's the baby. I apologize, um, but yeah, and and hearing about the ways in which um, some some um, Catholic academics have been writing about it, because I think um, there's an excitement to have have a young, um, especially a young younger woman Catholic Catholic writer, um, and so it's been written about, and sometimes in ways that I'm surprised by and um, ways that I, I want to argue with. That's interesting and, and surprising to me too. Um, yeah, any anything, uh, Larissa or Tori? I was fortunate in that um, I never actually encountered the bad face reader that I was really worried about. I mean, I'm sure these are conversations that were being had between um, individuals, but I didn't hear about it, so that was nice. Uh, what was actually really lovely about reading reviews, and I, I did read all of mine, um, <laughs> even though I didn't want to, like I would see one and I'd be like, I'm not gonna read that. And then like later I'll be reading it on my phone, like on the train or something. <laughs> um, but Pop Song reached a lot of like college, uh, like, literary or like um, newspapers. A lot of the reviews came from like smaller publications. Um, and it was very beautiful to just see like these critics um, working through the book in very like open and vulnerable ways and really like meeting the book as the readers that I had most wanted to encounter it. Um, and to see people like really reading deeply and then, you know, putting their own spin on it was really, really moving, honestly. Like I love criticism. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. I think it's such an important tool, both for like, you know, talking about the things that we see and make, but 
but also for our own understandings of like why art is important. Um, and it was just like the best gift ever to just like be met by like so many cool readers who I didn't know I had until this book came out. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, and then I got one stinker of a review that I was just like, I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to not going to talk about that. Um, but yeah, it was really, really special. That's yeah, great. Yeah, I, that's something that our members are really going to want to hear about that those like small press, like smaller out of the way reviews like can really make a difference. Yeah, I I loved the reviews. I, I read them. I, I, I've i learned slowly to not read my own interviews, um, but I do read what, so I don't read what I have to say anymore, but I read what other people have to say. And um, yeah, I, I I'm really grateful. I was I I'm now in the stage where there's translations of um, the book, and I am extremely impressed with American reviewers. Like the American reviewers did an incredible job, and the outlets that are available for American reviewers, um, I really felt were like very thoughtful. Especially as I've begun to see how reviews can happen. In, in other places, in other literary contexts. So I, I, I don't think I saw a single one in the United States that even if it was said something that was, um, that I disagreed with that I didn't think it was like fair or, or, or a good faith or, you know, um, coming from a place of basically loving literary culture. Um, I will say that, that my one experience with like a, a bad review that I, that, it's also funny the way that you discover that reviewers are like people who also see how their reviews circulate in the world. Like I had one review that I think is a bad review. Uh, it, was, it, it was technically a good review, but what it did is it said, this is a good book and, and it's a good book because finally trans women in this book, trans women are admitted, admitting that they're like gross perverts basically. And therefore it's a good book because we're finally seeing the truth about trans women. And uh, and I told my reviewer, uh, I mean, I told my 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 publicist, I was like, I don't want that blurb on. Yes, there's a lot of nice things about review sets, but I don't I don't want that blurb on my book. I don't want it anywhere in my materials. I don't want to give that, that person the satisfaction. And um, and like the most gratifying thing for me was like a year and a half later seeing that that person had complained that their that their, that their positive review was not blue in any of the marketing materials. Oh, and I was like, yes, vengeance. And also it was like, it was such like a window into like, yeah, reviewers are looking to see how their work gets picked up, how they are in conversation with authors, like do, how they're in conversation with the whole like production of these books and the marketing and like that, all the different sides of it, um, the way that this stuff circulates, it all, it was all, a lot of it was revealed to me through like, through the reviews and, and, and the reviewers and the reviewers own personalities. That story is, is amazing. And I, I'm definitely gonna like sleuth out who that was. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you offline. Yeah, I mean, off that when we're not gonna record it. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I think we have a few. Yeah, we have about five minutes. Um, if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, uh, there's time if you want to share it in the chat. Uh, any any questions? Um, and OK, I'm not seeing anything yet. I know, um, Larissa, earlier you, you mentioned um, that you'd love to talk more about um, genre switching. Um, do you have any anything you want to ask or bring up about that? I guess I was curious if it seemed like something that was available to either of you. I know that there is that pre-publication gauntlet where everyone has to write like 10 essays, um, which I think could understandably put you off essay writing. Um, but I know like uh, like Isle McElroy, for example, who also had a book come out the same year as me, aka last year, um, recently published a poem. And I was thinking about like, you know, are there other formats or other genres that have felt appealing um, in the wake of like <laughs> this, this moment that can have a chilling effect on one part of one's practice, but maybe live in another? Um. 
Yeah, for me, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it's interesting that you moved to, to fiction because I originally was a nonfiction writer too. And it was like in fiction, I could finally tell the truth. But I've actually found, I had some opportunities to do screenwriting um, this year. And I actually found that screenwriting is, it, it's, there's a formula to it. And there's like a, there's like a pacing to it. And in the sort of like uh, anxiety of post-publication that, that being able to rely on the, on the, on the beats of screenwriting has been so nice for me because it's like, ultimately I just got to get through the scene and get to the next beat. And that forces me to produce and not have a lot of self-consciousness. So like my genre switch is to screenwriting at the moment. Um, and it's, but I think it's a, an emotional switch rather than like an artistic switch. I, um, I was writing essays um, before the, the book came out and not, not the sort of pre-publication essays. And I think in the anxiety of, of the book coming out, I stopped that because I thought if, if it feels this scary to put out a piece of fiction, then um, nonfiction is going to be terrifying. I, yeah, nonfiction writers, I'm, I'm always, I'm just in awe of the courage um, that, that that must take. Um, yeah, but again, now that, you know, a year has passed, I'm beginning to think, oh, it would be fine. <laughs> and, um, so I'm, I'm going back to some of those essays. Um, so we have two, oh, sorry, you wanna add No, to please, her? please, no, please go ahead with the questions. Um, we have two questions from the audience uh, that I, I think we can kind of bundle into one, especially in the interest of, of time. Uh, the, the first one is um, what uh, first book authors are you all reading now? And that's from Jane Chabatari. And the second uh, is from Kate Bussert. And it's, I know you all mentioned some previous inspirations, but who or what is inspiring you now as you work on your next projects? Um, so I I just had a baby, and so I'm not feeling especially inspired right now by, <laughs> um, but I I'm reading um, Jasmine Chan's The School for Good Mothers, which is a really wonderful wonderful novel, um, and I'm also reading a lot of books by um, you know people who wrote many many books. Um, I'm reading Tessa Hadley's new novel Free Love and. I read Karen Joy Fowler's booth recently and Elizabeth Taylor's um, Mrs. Um, Palfrey at the Claremont. Um, so I'm, I'm really enjoying reading. Um, I just started this book. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get their name right, but it's a Dutch author. Uh, probably maybe David, you know, The Discomfort of evening Maria, Maria uh, but it's about a, a Dutch non-binary person oh, yeah. uh, now growing up a Christian on a farm and it's a first book I'm reading it in English it was written in Dutch but uh, it's um, the language is incredible and uh, I haven't finished it so I, you know I don't I can't say overall the full arc of the of the story, but I will say that it's um, it was hugely popular in 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 Europe and um, and it is a very interesting approach to to writing that that I'm really into at the moment. Cool. I've mean to check that out. I have a I have a gallery. It was a couple of years ago that it was published. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, Larissa, anything? Um, I'm really trying to think if I've read anyone's first book recently, and I'm ashamed to say that I don't know if I have because I can't. I'm like, was that a first book or was it a second book? I've been reading a lot of people's second books recently, which has been nice. Um, I just picked up a copy of Bliss Montage, which is Ling Ma's second book after Severance, Severance, which 
I feel like everyone who has lived through this pandemic absolutely must read. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to read that. And then I, I'm also reading Ian Lee's The Book of Goose right now, which is a really fantastic novel. It's like her sixth, so definitely not a first book. Um, but it's it's been really great. And it is also a book about writing books. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, Jay and Chabatari, for organizing and the Brooklyn Book Festival and, and Maris Kriesman for bringing all these writers together. Sorry you couldn't be here tonight. Um, and yeah, thanks again, everyone. Thank Good night. You. Thank you all.